After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week. Very early on the first day of the week, just after the sun had risen. At the crack of dawn on Sunday. Before the sun had risen on the Sabbath. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to keep vigil at the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. The women came to the tomb, carrying the burial spices they had prepared. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb where his body was laid to rest. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven. Coming to the stone, he rolled it away and sat on it. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. They found the entrance stone rolled back from the tomb, so they walked in. But once inside, the body of the Master Jesus was nowhere to be found. In the darkness, Mary discovered the stone had been moved away from the entrance.
The grave is empty. Christ is risen. Alleluia. This is the good news. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness can never overcome it. Alleluia. Hear this good news. Once we were broken and alone. Now we are made whole in God's family. Alleluia. And here is our gospel. Christ, Christ was, was born. born. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Alleluia. Amen. From the first days, the ancient greeting of the people of the Christian faith is, The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Would you greet one another in Christ's holy name? Happy Easter morning. This is the strange other end of Christmas, if you believe it or not. Remember on Christmas when we had the big Christmas tree and we sang all the Christmas songs because Jesus was born? And then maybe some of you were, I don't think, but maybe some of you were here Friday when we had a very different kind of day. That was a birthday. Good Friday was kind of a hard day. It's when Jesus dies. And today... We're celebrating that he's born again in a, in a different way, you know. It's a, do, you, do you know about, death is kind of a hard thing, but you know when you're born, the very, what's the very first thing you do when you're born? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and your mom, this is, no. No, really, the first, before you can cry, what do you have to do? Yeah, you got to breathe so you can, yeah, you've got to breathe first. That's the very first thing that happens is you draw in breath. And then every single minute the rest of your life you're breathing until you don't breathe anymore and you draw your last breath. We believe that that life itself is in that breath. God's spirit is breathed into us. And all our lives long we have that breath and we can sing, we can cry, we can blow trumpets and trombones and make music all life long. We are living and we're making music, living and breathing in the world until we're not, until we're not. And that's what happened to Jesus. He had kind of a hard death. He didn't, uh, you know, he didn't die in the hospital and he didn't get hit by a car. He was specifically killed because some people were pretty angry with him. Killed him on, a, on the cross. That was what they used to punish people back then. So his friends who had celebrated his living and breathing and preaching and teaching and maybe he sang. Did you ever think about Jesus singing? Do you think he could carry a tune? We'll never know. You think so? I'm for that. Okay. He was probably a tenor, don't you think? <laughs> You'd like that, Louie, wouldn't you? Bach disagrees. <laughs> Bach disagrees? All right, you can get the bad puns from the choir director later. <clears throat> anyway, so Jesus, Jesus dies. But then his friends come, and they think they're going to have a memorial service. They're coming to do the things that we usually do at a memorial service, but surprise, the tomb, the cave is empty, and instead all they find are some white cloths like that just like we have draped up there. They were, they were kind of wadded around over here, and some of them were folded over there, and there was, there was no body. It was like the music had gone out of the trumpet, but now it had come back in, and now the music and the trumpet were someplace else, and they couldn't figure out what it meant. Not long after that, Jesus came and talked right to them and said, but don't, don't, don't touch me. I'm kind of I'm kind of in between right now, in between. And after that, he gave his breath to them, to all of us, to keep singing and telling about this amazing story. So I realized, I realized that, you know, this white cloth up here, it really shouldn't be there. It shouldn't be there because the cross, we celebrate the cross is empty. Jesus isn't there anymore. He's not dead. He is risen. So we shouldn't have the cloths there. We should see the empty cross. Confirmation, proof, evidence that Jesus is risen today. So I need your help to take the cloth down. Can you do that with me? Come here. Some of you, some of you go over there. Mr. Louie's going to help. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need somebody to hold the rope over here. You help? Okay. It takes, it's a little bit of a trick. 
So there's this one. So can you get a hold? Let's see. Let's make sure it's not tangled. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, so you got this one? Hold that one. Hold that one. You got that one, Luby? Not quite? You all set? Okay, so you are going to kind of let it go while you guys pull this one. You got to back up. Can you back up? And you pull on that one? Yeah, let it go. You're going to let it go. Just like that. Yeah. I'm going to take it all the Whoa, I'm going to keep it out of the flowers. Keep it out of the, keep it out of the candles. You ready? You ready to flip it over? I'm going to flip it over. Ready? Okay, you guys grab onto that one. Now, wait a minute. I'm going to unclip it if I don't trip over it. Yeah. So we're going to unclip it. You got it? Okay. Can you pull it out of the ropes here? I think this could get more complicated. <laughs> it's just a big sheet, really, but it's like an octopus. Okay, you got it? Okay, keep going with it. Take, take it right out there down the aisle, would you? Right down there, all the way, that way. There we go. You got it? Okay, so now you guys come together here. You guys come together here. And hold it. We all got it? All right. Can you want to grab that right there? Can you hold that? And now let's pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that through birth, life, death, and new birth, you are always present and showing us the way. We carry away these clothes knowing that you are in our lives every day, coming again every day to show us the kingdom you have called into being. We ask it in your name. Amen.
Good morning. It's a special day in many regards, but a special, special day in the sense that we're going to welcome some new folks into membership here in this congregation, especially our confirmation class this year. So I want to invite them to uh, stand and come forward. Uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, through this ritual of membership, we welcome these persons as professing and transferring members of Christ's Holy Church and of this congregation of the Methodist Church. Through affirmation and reaffirmation of faith, we acknowledge that God, what God has done for us and is doing for us, that God is at work through us day by day, and we especially remember and renew the covenant declared at our baptism, the touchstone of our common call to ministry. So I invite those who are about to join this congregation and all of you present who are confirmed in membership to remember your baptism and be thankful. The, the ancient phrase is, we remember and are thankful. Would you say that? We remember and are thankful. So through these acts of remembrance and commitment to Christ's holy church, we become one together in the body of Christ, the church in the world today. Thanks be to God who offers this without price. Let me say now to the uh, prospective members, do you accept God's freely given grace and confess your own faith in God revealed in Christ Jesus? Will you seek to continue to grow in the Christian faith, the understanding of scriptures, and to develop the discipline of public and private worship of God? Will you seek God's compassion and justice in your life and in the whole family of God? If so, say, we do and we will. We do and we will. So brothers and sisters, I have met with these new friends face to face and through conversation, prayer and discernment, I confirm they are ready, honestly, knowledgeably and sincerely to accept God's grace for their own. Therefore, I now recommend them for membership in the church so that they might join with this body in a life worthy of the gift of life. Will you affirm this recommendation? If so, say, we do. We do. We're good. I invite all of us now to stand and join in the affirmation of faith. This is uh, one among many that is in our hymnal. I make a, a note there that it says it's the modern affirmation, but it is from 1966. So you'll hear some historic language, but this is a uh, language uh, that has its roots in about the time when this congregation was founded. So I invite you to join with me in offering this. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works, and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual membership of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. I invite you all to be seated, but let me ask the confirmands and Jackie and Lexi to come and just stand right here in front of me. If you guys will come around and turn and face me. But this is uh, an act of prof prof uh, profession of faith, and so we have uh, special words to go with it. And I've asked Kamel as our co-lay leader to join with me in the laying on of hands as we bring them into membership. So we're going to start with you, Karina. Karina, may the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Amen. Ethan, may the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Amen. Brandon, may the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you might live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Amen. Lexi, may the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you might live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Amen. Jackie, 
May the Holy Spirit work within you, that having been born through water and the Spirit, you may live as a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Amen. Now let me last ask all of you as members of Christ's universal church, will you be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its witnesses and ministries? If so, say, I will. And to the members of this congregation, this is your part, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? If so, say, I will. I will. Members of the household of God, I commend these persons to your love and care. Do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and perfect them in love. Would you join in reading? We give thanks for all that God has already given you and we welcome you in Christian love as members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the whole church by our prayers, presence, gifts, and service that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. Now may the God of all grace who has called us to eternal glory in Christ establish you and strengthen you by the power of the Holy Spirit that you might live in grace and peace. Amen. If you... Here we go. And God will raise you up on you. Would you join with me in prayer? When everything is leaning in on us, when everyone is pulling us to pieces, when the ground trembles and the sky grows dark, come Holy Spirit, lift us up. Fill this place, our hearts, and your world so that we might glimpse the light shining from the tomb. In the name of the living Christ, we pray. Let us be in prayer. O risen one, come and meet us in the garden of this life. Lure each one of us into celebration. Revive our silent hopes. Coax out our dormant dreams. Raise up our neglected gratitude. Revive our tired enthusiasm. Resurrect our faltering relationships. Roll back the stone of our indifference and unwrap the deadness in our spiritual lives. O risen one, meet us and renew us as disciples of your unwavering love, let us be messengers of your unlimited joy. O resurrected one, may we become ever more convinced that your presence lives on and on and on. O risen one, awaken us. We ask it in the name of Christ who taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our Heavenly Father, we come here after Lent, a time of darkness and reflection, to discover the light and joy of Easter morning, 
and we are moved to share this joy with others. We feel the radiance and warmth of your love and acceptance just as we are in this very moment. And we are moved to share this love and acceptance with others. We marvel at your grace that is present in so very many things, and especially in the unexpected things. And we moved to share it with others. And may we now in this moment be inspired by your generosity and compassion and join these gifts together with ourselves and our service to be the blessing that is shared with others. Amen. After the disciples returned to their homes, Mary remained weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and there she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, that I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbi. This means teacher. And Jesus said to her, Mary, you cannot hold me. I must rise above this world to be with my Father, who is your Father, my God, who is your God. Go and tell this to all my followers. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Because the first thing I wanted to say is Easter is a story about death. Now, don't worry. We've already had some great brass, and we're not quite done and we're going to do some great singing, but we have to talk about death to talk about life. Easter for me, like uh, many folks, especially some folks here this morning, 
is very much about death, personal death in our families and relationships, in our experiences. My, the first time I was in a church on my own, my first Easter Sunday on my own, we finished a glorious service of worship and walked out to the back, and I was going to shake hands, but across the street there were two fire trucks and an ambulance come to take away one of our senior members who had passed away in her kitchen on her way to coming to church Easter morning. So death definitely made an imprint on me that day. It reminded me that Easter is indeed about death. There are others here who have had similar experiences. This week, Sharon Ellis uh, will forever have the week of Easter marked by the loss of her husband, Jack. Just two Sundays ago, I was feeling unaccountably blue. I, I couldn't figure out why, and I finally decided to take the dog for a walk down to the park, and along the way, I realized I hadn't talked to my sister in Michigan for a while, so I thought, oh, I know she's at home on Sunday evenings. I'll call her. So I called her, and she said, I was just thinking of calling you, and we talked for a few moments, and then suddenly we realized we were both feeling blue. And it's because that day was the five-year anniversary of our mother's death. Our bodies remember what our minds try to put behind us. It was the fifth anniversary to the day. Her, her memorial service was in the week immediately following Easter. And I remember for our home congregation, it was complicated because she was the one who always took care of the memorial services and everybody was away on vacation. But somehow or another, we had to uh, handle that reception. And then on this morning, two millennia ago, Mary and the others went to visit the freshly interred remains of their brutally executed friend, Jesus. But first comes these two guys. They meet two men whom the scripture says wore clothes as white as snow that were like lightning. But here's a footnote for you. If you look up the Greek, what the word lightning actually comes from is it means it literally means the verb to glimmer fling to fling glimmer that's what the word means they were shining in this radiant way they meet these two men who say straight off do not be afraid i know you are looking for your friend jesus who was crucified but he is not here when they rush back to tell the other disciples about the empty tomb they meet jesus and the first thing he says is, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. What, what can that mean, do not be afraid? In the face of death, what are we to make of that? That's our password phrase for this Easter. Do not be afraid. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of these our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O thou who art rock and redeemer. Amen. There is a website called fear.net. I love the web. You can find anything there. <laughs> List of a top 100 fears and the top Five phobias, according to fear.net, are fear of spiders, snakes, heights, open or crowded spaces, and dogs. That's the top five. Public speaking is number 13, ahead of chickens, sharks, the ocean, sharks in the ocean, <laughs> and get this, ducks. Ducks become before sharks on the list. There is plenty of fear in this Easter story as well. Starting, starting with the soldiers that are guarding the tomb. Remember the, uh, the earth quakes and the stone rolls back and the angels appear and the soldiers who are guarding the tomb become like dead men, it says. They are so afraid. And if you work backwards for why would they have soldiers there at a crypt, it's because the Judeans, the leaders in the temple, had convinced Pilate that he should post guards just in case somebody tries to steal Jesus' body and 
start proclaiming a miracle, making a martyr out of him. They were so afraid of this radical rabbi that they cornered Pilate into having him executed. Pilate's own wife is afraid that Jesus is in fact righteous and he shouldn't do anything, Pilate shouldn't do anything, tries to keep Pilate from getting blood on his hands, but he is more afraid of the political fallout if he doesn't act. Then, of course, we know, as we noted last week in the mix of this story, there's Peter, the leader of the pack of disciples, who turns chicken at the faintest questioning. And then once Jesus is crucified, all the disciples flee to the hill country, fearing for their lives. Fear is the big motor driving this story and ours. Two weeks ago, the business section of the LA Times reported that businesses, numbers of businesses, are booming on the tremendous upswing in people trying to reduce their rapidly rising fear and stress through yoga, various kinds of therapy, taking up boxing. They had a hilarious story about a 62-year-old woman who had taken up boxing to deal with her stress. Indeed. Immediately after the election season, churches, synagogues, and mosques all reported an upswing in attendance as people looked for places to try and make sense out of our roller coaster world, to deal with their fears. Locally, I've, I've been spending some time out at the Channel Islands University to try and research how this congregation might be in connection with the students and faculty and staff there. And when I have asked what is on the kind of the front burner in terms of the students' awareness, what their, what their interests are, what's the, kind of what's the dynamic, what's the temperature on campus, faculty, students, and the staff have all named the same thing. That in this appropriately rich, diverse ethnic community, the primary sense is fear. Fear of personal deportation, of parents being perhaps deported and breaking apart their families, fear for their educations and their job futures, really their entire future, they are at that phase of their life where everything hinges on what's going to happen next. They live in fear as well we might. Check the news. Tell the truth. Do you cringe a little bit when you turn the news on and find the channel for the news? Who knows what the latest news will be? Gas attacks? Bombs as big as a whale dropped mostly to show that we can? The end of the last week, another story about a man tackled and beaten and fortunately only arrested for jaywalking while black. That was his crime. More news of Muslim women harassed for wearing a headscarf. What would that do to your plans for each day as you go out? to whether or not wear what you wish to wear. Talk about living in fear. Many are living with a sense of being alone and uncertain in fear. At least my dear mother-in-law, who is visiting here from Michigan, has an effective coping tactic for watching our news. Compared to home, what she likes is, even, at least as much as our avocados, yesterday he went to the farmer's market and bought how many, 20? 20 avocados she's going to take home with her. <laughs> Almost as much as that, every evening she likes to surf the news for the latest car chase. <laughs> and every day there's like more than one. <laughs> Be not afraid. How is that supposed to work these days, Mr. Angel Messenger Jesus guy? And we haven't even talked about, yet talked about, number 12 on the top 100 list of fears, which is thanatophobia, fear of death. All the fears we might carry around day by day about, about politics, the economy, jobs, family, friends, our health, all of these are essentially about the quality of life. Fear of death is about the quantity of life. How long will it last? When does it end and how? 
If you think that's a personal health question or a generic philosophical question, I invite you to check out an article in the uh, first of this month's issue of The New Yorker called The God Pill. The God Pill. I'll try and remember to post it tomorrow. A long, bewildering, and sometimes bizarre article about the stone-cold, serious, big money pursuing the modern-day fountain of a youth. It used to be in ancient times that uh, they imagined that, for example, breathing the breath of virgins would stretch your life. Or transfusing uh, the blood of teenagers was a solution to beating death. But now we're talking about venture capitalists, multi-millions, near billion dollar deals, and at least one research company spun off and funded by no less than Google. This is it's big money, serious money. They're working on a variety of things. Mostly they're looking at DNA and trying to figure out how to unravel that. Because biologically, we are designed to die. In evolutionary terms, the article notes, we are like salmon. We, we are designed to spawn and die, only we do it in slow motion. Christianity does not excuse us from any of this. As an Episcopal priest once put it, we may be the Easter people, but we're not the darned Easter bunny. Death is real. Fear is real. But when we open up the definition of each of those, we find some clues to this phrase, be not afraid, and maybe what Jesus means when he says it. And he says it a lot. It is in the Bible over almost 100 times, 25 times in the New Testament alone, 18 times Jesus says it. Be not afraid. So let's, uh, let's play with it for a minute. The defini definition of fear in the dictionary is simple, and it, and it matches the reality of death. Fear, the feeling of alarm caused by the expectation of danger, pain, or disaster. But the deepest root of the word for fear is per, P-E-R, as in peril, meaning to risk, to try, to press forward, it's in the Latin experiere, to try to learn by trying, experience, experiment. It functions as the base of prepositions and words meaning forward, to go through, to be in front of, before, early, first, toward. Now get this, last month I checked in with our brother Cal Brain, 102 years old. He knows he is on the brink of death, and he is eager to prepare for what he calls the great transition. Isn't that marvelous? The great transition. I was eager to hear what 102 years of accumulated wisdom might be, and sure enough, he said, among other things, there is no end to spiritual growth, surprisingly. I am still learning at 102. I am still learning. He also said, I enjoy your puzzling sermons, <clears throat> which uh, <laughs> I'll have to go back and ask him about that. This, maybe this is one of them. Main thing he said was, I am facing an event of which I have no prior experience. I look forward to the blessings of the next world as I tread this unknown path. Whew. He is not being afraid because he has shifted the perceived risk, the expectation of disaster and fear, shifted that to the anticipation of a blessing and is moving toward it. Be not afraid, the angel said to Mary. Expect something different, not a disaster. Anticipate something good, Jesus says to Mary. Be not afraid. Now that works for our, our fear of our own death, perhaps, but there, I think there are two other forms of fear and death that are in the gospel and in this story. So try this. Three weeks ago was the anniversary of my mother's death, 
and in three weeks it will be the anniversary of my father's death, both in the same year, one year before I came here. These past few years I have reflected on what I learned from my father, who was pretty quiet, pretty standoffish. So I remember the one time I saw him crack. I remember this was a guy who served in two wars and saw plenty of death. I've told the story here before that my brother died in a car crash at the age of 16. So when I was 16, getting the keys to the family car was going to be an extremely limited proposition. Very, very infrequent and limited. One time that I did have the car and I, you know, as a teenager, I came home later than was scheduled. My father confronted me and laid it out hard, tears glinting around his eyes. He was not going to have me, as he said it, ramming around in the car because he was not going to go down to the morgue again to identify the lifeless body of another son. Now I understood a different kind of death. Not my own. Not my own. But what it is like to lose, lose the life of a loved one. It is an even more terrible death because we are left behind. A break, a separation, the loss of a vital connection, and an even greater fear to go with it. One woman who enjoyed a long and vivid marriage described what it felt like after her husband died tragically and unexpectedly. She called it the great amputation. I think of that when I do weddings. I wish for the couple that they will be married long enough to grow to feel both the blessing and the burden of that bond. That when we hear that phrase, the great amputation, those of us who have been married a while know what that is. Fear of death as fear of separation. Death as separation matches another and older definition of fear. In the Bible, the word used for fear, the word that the angels use and that Jesus uses in the garden when he says, be not afraid, is phobos. Is it up there? Yes. Greek, phobos, which we recognize as the suffix of phobia that goes with all those fear, but its root is in the word phobomai. And what that means is to flee or withdraw, to separate from, to remove oneself. Bells going off, anyone? In response to our fear of death as separation, Jesus comes and says, be not afraid, which means do not flee or withdraw. Do not separate yourself from this moment, from this relationship. Stay close, stay connected. In the face of death, take the risk and see it through. Be in this experience. Expect something different, even something good, for death is not the end, and ultimately death is not separation. How can this be? Who says so? Jesus the Christ, the one who did not fear death, who did not flee it, but embraced it, the great transition, who walked the Lenten path to the ultimate experience, even unto the cross, embodying the divine desire to be with us, directly in relationship with us, showing us that we are not apart from the very author of life itself, but rather, what was the name we heard at Christmas? What did we start with? His name shall be called Emmanuel. God is with us. It's all there from the beginning. Incarnation replaces separation. Here's just some of the phrases in the text where it says, do not be afraid. The angel says to Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. The angels say to the shepherd, do not be afraid, for see, I'm bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. 
Later, Jesus says to Simon, do not be afraid from now on, you will be catching people. And do not be afraid, even the hairs on your head are counted. You are of more value than many sparrows. You are more than just a body. Do not be afraid, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. And the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid. You're looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He has been raised. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers and sisters to, how can we read it? To take the risk, to press forward and go to Galilee. They will see me there. Revelations 1.17, he placed his right hand on me saying, do not be afraid. I am the first, the last, the living one. I was dead and see I am alive forever and ever. So we can say with confidence to the writer of Hebrews 13, 6, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can anyone or anything do to me? That's your cue. Grab your hymnal. I'm not kidding. Turn in the back of your hymnal, number 887. We read that old 1966 affirmation, but this one's better. It's Paul's affirmation in Romans, number 887. Might as well be called, be not separated. You find it? Have you got it? Stand up. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress? Be not afraid. Or persecution or famine? Be not afraid. Or nakedness or peril or the sword? Be not afraid. Now it's your part. Let me read it again. Shall tribulation or distress, persecution or famine, nakedness or peril or the sword? You better make this sing. No. no. In all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen? Amen. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Amen.
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Thank you.